If you'll be turning uh, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to finish this week and next week, and then we'll be looking at the book of Hebrews uh, for the rest of the year. Last week, um, after my sermon on marriage, I had several men come up to me after the service and in their best sarcastic voices slap me on the back and say, thanks for that fine sermon. Um, I had one, in fact, come up and ask me to start this morning's sermon uh, using a football analogy uh, and start off by saying, upon further review, the call is reversed uh, from last week. Uh, to this week. Now, if you weren't here last week, I'm sorry, you won't understand some of that, but um, uh, the entire passage last week uh, on husbands and wives was a fun one uh, to, to preach. Uh, yeah, that was kind of funny too, right? That entire passage last week on husbands and wives, and then our passage this week on uh, children and parents, uh, and slaves and masters, all three of these examples, these relationships that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus about, all fall really under verse 21 of chapter 5, which simply says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And so in each of these three living examples from the life and times that Paul lived in, each of these earthly examples, Paul writes about these on two different levels. <clears throat> he writes on the earthly level of what that relationship really should look like here as we live out our daily lives. And last week we talked about wives... Um, loving and submitting to their husbands, husband, loving their wives as Christ loved the church, right? In each of these sections on relationships, Paul couches it in the deeper meaning that this passage not only reflects how we live out now, but this passage reflects a greater, a deeper meaning of our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we look at these first nine verses of chapter 6, we're going to be looking at that uh, under that overall heading of submission in relationship, submitting to Christ as our ultimate head. So let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's most holy word. We believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And like they did in the days of Ezra, we stand for its reading. Hear the word of the Lord as I begin in chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes own you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever uh, good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, do not treat your slaves in the same way, or treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with Him. Father, we pray now that You would bless the reading and the hearing of this Your Holy Word, but we pray we would see no man save Christ alone 
For it's in His name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. I've always thought that it was um, difficult at best to tell parents how to raise their children. Um, If you've never had children, uh, you have really uh, no room uh, to talk to parents who are trying to raise children. And if you have raised children, um, when you watch another couple with theirs, I guess the saying that comes to your mind uh, there, but by the grace of God, go I, maybe, perhaps. Here's where it shows up. You're in the store, and you look down the aisle. You're at Walmart, let's just say. And you're looking down the aisle or in the grocery store, and there's a kid just really acting out, yelling, screaming, crying, fighting the mama or the daddy. Now, if you have not had children... This is your reaction. Man, does that mother not know how to take care of her kids? What is she doing? How is that daddy handling that child? Golly, Pete. Now, that's the reaction if you've never had children. If you've had children, you come around the aisle and you look down there and say, that poor mother, oh, bless her heart. <laughs> that, that poor daddy, oh, golly, I know he, I am embarrassed for him. I know he would rather crawl in a hole than be here in the grocery store, right? So we've all done this. We've all kind of looked and thought and said one thing and then another. And, you know, I've always, there, there are a couple of things that they don't teach you in seminary. Uh, one is how the pastor who has never been married can do marriage counseling. Uh, and how the pastor who has never had children can preach about raising children, Right? You have to have the T-shirt to really have any uh, ability to speak. But the problem is that for any pastor, uh, people come to you all the time saying, help me with my kids. And um, you can only really look to the Word of God and uh, your own experience, perhaps, uh, as a reservoir for help there. Prayer is always the first thing out of my mouth uh, when I even think about my own own children. Now, let me make one um, serious remark about this whole group of relationships that Paul is talking about here. These three different examples of earthly relationships that he uses to pivot to teach us about submission to Christ. We talked last week about how wives submitting to their husband could, in certain situations, if not presented correctly, uh, lead to um, a pushback against Christianity. But let me just say from the outset this morning that Christianity has done more for women, children, and about slavery than anything or person or religion that has ever existed. If you think about women, um, if you look at even today at other world religions, women, particularly in uh, Islam, are uh, kept down. Uh, They're not allowed to drive. They're not allowed to study. Uh, They're told who they're going to marry. Christianity brings a, as I used the word last week, a complementarian ideal for men and women. That we are both created in the image of God. And there is no less value in a woman than there is in a man. Yes, there are different genders. Yes, there are different economic roles within the kingdom of God that God has called women to and called men to. But there is absolute equality before the Lord. We are all created in the image of God. Christianity has raised up 
the ideal of women in so many ways into the, the image of creation as God intended. Now, when we think about children too, uh, if you think about Paul's day of uh, when he lived under Roman law, a father could accept or reject a child. Uh, the way it usually worked was a child that had been newly born was brought and placed before the father. If the father reached down and picked up the child, the child lived. If the father turned his back, the child was actually cast out into the street to either be picked up by those who would rescue it or were um, uh, left to die. Children worked in slave labor. A father who became extraordinarily displeased with a child could beat that child, could sell that child into slavery, and even, hear me when I say this, he even had the right to have a child executed. Christianity has protected children. And in terms of slavery, that's pretty obvious. It was the Christian faith and the, the, the deep abiding faith of William Wilberforce in England that ended the slave trade in England. It was Abraham Lincoln, an avowed Christian who loved Christ, who helped to end slavery here. Christianity has led the way most of the time in equal rights. Now, have there been abuses to that? Absolutely. Has the church failed in many ways? Sure. Just a couple of synods ago, our own denomination confessed before the Lord that we had not acted in Christian love and obedience in race relations that there was an inequity in some people's minds years and years ago. And many other denominations have done that as well. But Christianity, if we base it on the Bible, not on our own prejudice interpretations of it, teaches the equality of every human being created in the image of God. And Revelation teaches us that the church of Jesus Christ is made up of every race and tongue and tribe. We will worship with very, very different people than we see seated here in the new Jerusalem. And I praise God for that. But let's look specifically at what Paul has to say here. Well, Paul gives us some, um, some very specific things. He says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The first thing he mentions here in this parent-child relationship, as he's modeling that for us, even as adults, being adopted children of God the Father, <clears throat> he says that we are to obey our parents. Now, we see obedience, we see honor here, right? These are two things that the Bible teaches. I don't care how old you are, you are still a child of the king, an adopted child of the king. And so these, these uh, principles apply to your life as well as to mine. But on the surface, earthly level, Paul says that children are to obey. That is, they're to show obedience to their parents. That is right. It's written on the conscience by God. It is the right thing to do. It is natural law that children should obey their parents. When parents teach their children to obey them, they are teaching them in a roundabout way, to obey God. 
And the cross, the backside of that coin is also true. When you allow your children to defy you, when you allow your children to disobey you, when there are no consequences to those things, you show them the path to disobedience to Christ. As you raise your children, you are showing them and modeling for them, even in a fallen way, what their relationship ultimately as they grow and become believers in Jesus Christ should look like with their heavenly Father. So when you give them the right to defy you, to disobey you, to turn their back on you, when you say, <clears throat> well, that battle's really not worth fighting, you are giving them the path, the opportunity to understand and see that there are no consequences to disobedience to God. Now, there are battles that you choose to fight and battles that you choose not to fight. But when you choose not to fight a battle on something that is vital, that is important, you're paving the way for disobedience. Honor is the next thing that is taught here. It's, uh, Paul quotes the fifth commandment uh, honor your father and your mother um, and he he sets this idea of children obeying your parents and honoring your parents within the context of that commandment now honor and obedience again are part of the natural law this is what children should do this is what we as believers in Jesus Christ should do to God our father we are to obey and honor them, Him as the King. We are to submit to Him because we love Him. All of these things play an important role within our household, but also within the household of God. We talked this morning at Sunday school as we talked about what it means to be an ARP and a member of an ARP church. We, 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 we looked at that the, the church is an adopted family. Right. And as part of that family, we have a parent that we love and we obey out of love and we honor out of love because of what he has done for us. Now, parents don't get off the hook, <clears throat> much like husbands did not get off the hook in the last example that Paul gave. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Parents, you must be worthy. Grandparents, you must be worthy of honor and respect, right? You must live out that higher calling so that when your children look at you, they don't say, <clears throat> we're not teaching do as I say, not as I do, right? That's so easy to do. We want children to not only hear us, but see obedience to God the Father in us. We need to model honor and obedience for our children and be worthy of a child's obedience and honor. Colossians 3, 21 repeats this same idea when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, Do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Parents, you are to bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, maybe one last comment before we leave this particular section. Parents, we're, we're, we're to model this for our children. Children are to obey and honor their parents. But there will come a time in every child's life where your child <clears throat> becomes responsible for themselves. When children go off the rails, uh, as an expression might call it, when they 
give in to the desires of their own heart to satisfy their own lust, uh, their own wants, their own needs above the needs of Christ. It is so easy for parents to blame themselves. Um, a dear family that I grew up with, my family doctor as I grew up, uh, best friends of my parents, uh, had a son who was um, a few years younger than I was. And at the age of 16 or so, probably even before that, probably about 14, gave himself over to alcohol and drugs. And those parents, I remember sitting with them at their table as they beat themselves up for Graham's decisions. It's so easy for parents to say, what did I do wrong? Now, sometimes you did screw up. Sometimes you didn't model what needed to be modeled for your children. But when you have children that give in to their own sinful desires, who have not, perhaps, you hope that they've come to Christ, but there's very little evidence of Christ in their life, you cannot beat yourself up. You can pray. You can lift that child, even that adult child, up before the Lord. Uh, my friend Graham is now a pastor in the Midwest. Um, and another family called me whose daughter went off on a, a sexual gamut after she had been married and I had done her marriage counseling and they called me in tears. Did you see any evidence they begged me that this would happen? And I hadn't. Now that young lady has come back and has expressed her repentance and um, is in a healthy relationship. God never gives up on you, and we cannot give up on our children. And yet, at the same time, we cannot blame ourselves, for each person is responsible to God for themselves. That is one of the hardest lessons that we make, that we learn as parents. And so when you leave today, I want you to leave with this understanding that if your child at some point in time does something that is offensive to God and to you, it is not always your fault. We are all idol makers and we all generate false gods. Praise be that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is long-suffering for us. For if God judged me on my own sinfulness, I would have been cast into the lake of fire long ago. And so we pray, we plead before the throne, but ultimately every life stands in the hands of God's providence and care jesus christ saves you cannot listen to me you cannot save your children your faith cannot save your children only jesus christ saves praise the lord now lastly and quickly paul pivots from Children and parents to slaves and masters. Now, this may seem a foreign passage to us <clears throat> today because, uh, at least in this country, there's no such thing as slavery anymore. Uh, although human trafficking is a horrible 
uh, uh, subculture that still permeates our world. But in Paul's day, it is estimated that half the population was slave, in slavery to the other half of the population. Slavery was uh, such a common thing. Uh, people often sold themselves into slavery to get out of their dire situation. And so Paul speaks here of, again, these roles of, um, uh, of, of being subservient to those who are in charge. You could take uh, verses 5 through 9 and, and apply the same principles, perhaps, in a more meaningful way to us today, to employer and employee. Not that employees are slaves by any stretch of the imagination, but the principles of employees working for, uh, with all their diligence for those who have given them a job and for those who are employers to treat their employees with skill and love and respect are important principles that we can pull out of this to apply to our own lives. So often uh, we find certain employers who think that the employees owe them something um, in terms of uh, they're there just for their good, but it is a mutual relationship, and we should look at that. And again, submit this to the even deeper meaning that when it says here, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord rewards everyone who does good. Even further up, obey them who not only to win their favor uh, when their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, do the will of God from your heart. Again, these principles apply to all of us. Paul often in his letters calls himself a servant, a slave of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19b, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And the price that you were bought with is not gold or silver, but it is the blood of Jesus. And so within that same thing, we owe obedience to Jesus Christ. Well, with all three of these passages on relationships, it helps us to understand that we are to submit to Christ. That Christ has a call on every aspect of our lives. That as we model healthy relationships here on earth, we are also to model that healthy relationship in submission to the greatest relationship of all, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ is our King. God is our Father. And we are to submit to Him in life now because we will in life in the world to come. Amen.